I think you're a mute mark. Can you hear me? Good. We, we, we wait till about 1203, 1204. Sounds good. I like your tie. Mm. Thanks. I was saying, you know, we got to wear it at least one day of the year, right? So why not today? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's it's uh, Mark Siegler chatting. Um, wel welcome to um, the next to last talk in this year's annual series, uh, lecture series um, on ethics and the COVID-19 pandemic, medical, social, and political issues. But believe it or not, this is the 26th talk in that series. Um, uh, our speaker today um, is William F. Parker, MD, MS, uh, who's an assistant professor of pulmonary and critical care medicine, um, and is also an assistant director of the McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics here at the University of Chicago. Um, Will received his bachelor's degree in physics from Williams College and his MD from the Pritzker School of Medicine. Uh, here at the University of Chicago, Will completed his residency in internal medicine, then fellowships both in medical ethics and in pulmonary and critical care medicine, earned a master's degree in public health, and currently is completing a doctoral degree, uh, a PhD in health services research in the Department of Public Health Sciences. As a physician scientist who works clinically in the intensive care unit, Dr. Parker's research focuses on the allocation of scarce medical resources. Uh, he is specifically interested in applying advanced empirical methods to design allocation systems for multi-principled ethical frameworks. Will began his research career as a medical student working with us at the McLean Center um, uh, under myself and Lainey Ross um, on issues such as deceased donor organ allocation. And with their guidance, he secured an NIH K08 Career Development Award from the National Heart, Blood and Lung Institute 
uh, to develop a novel heart allocation system. Today, uh, Will Parker will be discussing scarce healthcare resource allocation, specifically in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. During the COVID pandemic, Dr. Parker was selected by the University of Chicago Medical Center Hospital Incident Commanders to form and chair the UCMC COVID-19 Ethics Resource Group, where he has developed critical care allocation and CPR guidance protocols that have been adopted by multiple other institutions in the city of Chicago. This group, the city of Chicago group, has forged strong ties with the local community and has worked to incorporate community input into pandemic decision-making. Will Parker also served on the UCMC COVID-19 Vaccine Allocation Committee and his writing on the COVID-19 vaccine has been featured in Health Affairs, JAMA Health Forum, USA Today, The Washington Post, and I could keep going. Dr. Parker's talk today is entitled Empirical, Empirical Assessment of Scarce Healthcare Resource Allocation Protocols. It's a delight to welcome Will Parker to our program. Dr. Parker. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, it's a really, it's an honor to be here as somebody who's trained in the McLean Center for so many years to be giving a talk in the seminar series is a true privilege. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. I got a lot of slides and a lot of, I want to share with you guys and get to the discussion as fast as I can. I, my only disclosure is that uh, Creative Development Award that Mark had mentioned earlier. So what I hope to do today is define the concept of absolute scarcity of healthcare resources. It's actually I think a little trickier than uh, most people assume. Uh, consider the ethical frameworks that currently exist for the allocation of scarce, absolute scarce medical resources. We're not gonna spend a lot of time debating the relative merits of one framework or the other, but it's important to get that sort of background and context because what really the meat of the talk is about the central role, I believe empiricism plays in developing and should play in developing these practical allocation protocols and really point to a lot of examples where the empirical methodologies um, used were insufficient or inadequate to, to actually design protocols that were uh, sufficient to meet the ethical frameworks they were created to fulfill. And we're going to focus specifically on two examples from allocation of scarce medical resources in COVID-19. All right, so what is absolute scarcity? So it's important to consider two concepts or the difference between absolute and relative scarcity, I think helps define it. Relative scarcity is something we're all too familiar with in the broken US healthcare system. There's structural inequities in the access to healthcare based on racial and socioeconomic lines. This leads to preventable violence and excess deaths. The policy and politics of relative scarcity are very hard, but the ethics are uncontroversial. You know, any basic clinical medical ethics um, analysis would lead to, you know, obviously these relative scarcities of access to healthcare should be overcome. And here's an example of relative scarcity in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, access to high quality ICU care. Many of the community hospitals throughout the city were getting overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients. Um, to be honest, they would have trouble taking care of a COVID-19 patient with severe ARDS in the best of times, just because they require such intensive levels of high quality ICU care. But in, in, the, in the height of the surges, both in the spring and in the winter, they were unable to transfer their patients out to higher level tertiary care center. And why was this? Well, the hospitals weren't accepting them. Um, there are structural financial barriers that don't incentivize hospitals to accept transfers from patients, particularly those who don't have insurance or who have Medicaid. Instead, they would pr rather preserve their capacity to do lucrative procedures on uh, the well-insured and wealthy. So this is an example um, that we wrote up and described in a health affairs blog with, with Harold Pollack, who's also associated with the McLean Center, and Caroline Kelly, who's an incoming PhD student at the university, of structural violence on across racial and socioeconomic lines mediated by relative scarcity, right? There were ICU beds available. We weren't out of them in the city of Chicago at any point. We never hit crisis standards of care or absolute scarcity, but 
we people certain people just didn't get access to it because of market failures. Um, so that's very different than what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about, which is this concept of absolute scarcity, where there's a fundamental hard supply limit. We can't fix this with some more egalitarian, clever market solution to properly align incentives and increase supply of whatever the healthcare resource we're concerned about. There just isn't enough to go around. And then therefore, violence from lack of care is unavoidable. Some people just aren't going to get it. And you have to make value judgments. And this is where the ethics starts to get controversial. So what's the classic example of an absolutely scarce healthcare resource in the United States? Deceased donor organs. There's uh, over 100,000 people on the wait list. It kind of went down a little bit because of the opioid epidemic. And there's something, there's like 33 people on this wait list who die every day. So it's kind of, you know, over one an hour um, die waiting for an organ daily. And so this is a chronic absolute scarcity of an important healthcare resource that I got my, you know, started with um, in the McLean Center, what got me interested in studying clinical medical ethics to begin with. Um, but unfortunately, we have absolute scarcity of oxygen right now in India, as I'm sure you've read the horrible uh, news reports there, you know, this example up here in this top left of this picture, option not available, cannot admit patients, right? There's, um, they're getting oxygen supplies that are roughly half of what they need to support patients in the hypoxic respiratory failure. And although this, you know, absolute scarcity is, of course, downstream from a poor infrastructure and, um, you know, other, you know, oxygen could be made not absolutely scarce. In this instant in, in India, it is. So absolute scarcity can also be temporary, which is also another confusing. But that's, I think, the best way to think of what's going on over there. They have to ration. And it appears they're doing it mostly by ability to pay and a combination of that and first come, first serve. All right. So, you know, how, how would we approach the rationing of absolutely scarce uh, healthcare resources? If we find ourselves in a situation, hard supply limit, we have to decide which patients are going to get it, which patients won't, who's going to live it or die. Um, this is a paper, a table that I've um, summarized from a very nice Lancet article, 2009, by Govind Prasad, Principles of, of Allocation of Scarce Medical Interventions. And I think many people in this audience will have problems with particularly, you know, the way Govind framed principle X or Y. But I think it's a nice article because it sort of lays out a big range of uh, ethically salient uh, values and principles that one could use to construct an ethical framework. The first category is this idea that everyone's a human being and should be treated equally. That sort of has two mechanisms, why either randomly assigning the resource or first come to first serve is fair in, in theory, right? But in practice, usually the rich and well-connected will cut to the front of the line. Prioritarianism is this idea that we should favor the worse off. Um, it's sort of the rule of rescue that motivates us allocating more resources towards the sickest first. Um, that's actually what's used in liberal allocation uh, with the MELD score. So the, the sickest patients are at the top of the list. It turns out that those are the same patients who have the greatest benefit from liver transplantation, but that's not necessarily true. And so a lot in this time of, of this article, uh, Govin talks about how overemphasis on the sickest first could lead to a very inefficient situation where saving far fewer lives than would be optimal if you sort of ignore the relative benefit each patient's getting from the resource, which of course is the next, the next tier here, right, with um, utilitarianism or maximizing total benefits. And then finally, there's this category of promoting or rewarding social usefulness, pretty sticky um, concept there, right? What, is, what does that really mean? Uh, but played a heavy role in vaccine allocation in particular. So it's the idea of patient, uh, uh, physicians and other frontline healthcare workers who are on the, you know, taking care of COVID-19 patients deserve reciprocity or payback for their time served. Or the other concept was we should vaccinate all the healthcare workers and people who are essential to the pandemic response to keep society functional, right? That's instrumental value, sort of paying it forward. Um, I would argue that's sort of like a maximizing benefits argument. Maybe it should be in the, the category above. But, you know, what I think this article does a nice job of is sort of laying out a, a wide range of options and, you know, pointing out that there's going to be conflict between ethical principles and values that I think a lot of uh, stakeholders in our society would, would point to as important. So maximizing benefits would mean you prioritize people based on uh, improvement in survival with treatment. 
that's in co direct conflict with the concept of treating people equally. Uh, young, fair, fair innings is this idea that everyone deserves to play their nine innings of baseball, live to be 65 or whatever we define a complete life. And therefore we should allocate more resources to the younger people compared to the older people. Um, that's in direct conflict with treating people equally. And then often the COVID-19 pandemic with vaccines would be in conflict with maximizing benefits because obviously the older people have such a higher risk of COVID-19 death that uh, vaccinating them first preferentially would maximize benefits to society. So you're not gonna escape conflict in almost all scenarios where you're gonna have to allocate a scarce resource. And therefore, you know, um, we need to develop a multi-principal framework to somehow balance these principles. You know, you can't just put all your eggs in one basket. There's going to create serious ethical violations and some other important principle. You have to deal with nuance and complicated um, balancing of, of ideas that needs to be formalized somehow in a protocol. And I think one good example of where there's sort of an immediate problem with the concept of maximizing benefits is you have to talk about, are you trying to save lives or life years? So here's an example of three patients of varying ages with different expected life expectancies um, uh, multiplied by their probability of survival to hospital discharge. And if you were trying to maximize the number of life years saved, you would allocate to the 28 year old. If you were trying to maximize the number of lives saved defined as survival to hospital discharge, you'd allocate to the 80 year old with advanced dementia in the center. Um, and so therefore, you know, you, you can't, and both of these ideas have some purchase with most people, right? So um, to totally ignore other ethically important principles will ultimately get you into trouble. Um, and you're going to have to construct frameworks, multi-principle frameworks. Um, and this is the one that, that Gobin came up with. You know, I definitely don't agree with all of this, right? This, um, you know, there's this idea that this, I don't really like that, um, younger, we shouldn't allocate so many resources to very, very young children because we haven't like invested that much as a society in them. So that's why like the maximum number of resources peaks out in between 15 and 20. But, um, and I think Gobin would say he would, he, he says that there's lots of things he'd like to change about the system. I don't know if that's one of them, but this is an idea. Um, this, what I, why I wanted to show this because this, this gets at the comp necessary complexity that's required um, when you actually work out your protocol in order to make one that won't create major ethical objections to one of these key values that, um, that people hold dear. And here's an example of another multi-principle framework, the first one I worked on with, with, with Dr. Ross. Um, it's one for deceased donor kidney allocation. The first, it's a lexically ordered or um, uh, framework. So there's one principle that's more important, that's equal opportunity, that everybody has an equal chance of receiving a de deceased donor kidney transplant but it's um, supplemented by fair innings. So within that constraint of equal opportunity, we give the youngest kidneys, which is sort of a proxy for the best kidneys to the younger patients. Um, and therefore we maximize uh, the probability that these people can live, play their nine innings of baseball, the younger people who are there, who are worse off for going into end-stage renal disease at a younger age. So multi-principle frameworks are necessary, important, and also necessarily complicated, right? Um, so <laughs> Govin and Zeke, Zeke Emanuel re revamped their, co their uh, paper for the COVID-19 pandemic. You guys probably all read this one back in the, in the spring in, in New England Journal. As you'll notice, it's very similar to the Lancet paper. The one thing that I thought was kind of funny is that the, the concept of prioritizing younger people uh, uh, fell, fell way down, uh, used only when it's, you know, aligns with maximizing benefits, basically has no weight in their recommendations. Um, and I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact they all both got 10 years older uh, between the two papers or not, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think this is, again, a good way to think about it, to, a good starting point uh, to start to think about this problem and the, and the necessary complexities involved. Um, so how do we go from these principles to a protocol? Um, and so, you know, there's this idea that you could do this without data, right? You could just, you know, you've done all this really careful ethical analysis. You've developed a normative ethical framework. You've balanced your ethical principles beautifully. You know, you've, you set up the correct lexical constraints and created a, a, a rigorous philosophical argument for that framework, right? And then the protocol should just fall out, right? Um, 
but this only works if there's uh, consequences are sort of irrelevant, right? If you know, if you're if you're um, if you don't really care about maximizing benefits, and you know, the old, you've made an argument that a lottery, a pure lottery, is the only way to go, then I guess you don't really need to look at data. But is if you're going to invoke any other principle except one, usually you're going to have to you're going to have to look at data, and, and empirical uh, work is going to have to be directly involved in developing the protocol and the sort of iterative process. And so I would argue with our equal opportunity supplemented by fair innings, the data of that situation was intricately involved with the with the framework we developed. The fact that the age distribution of deceased donor kidneys and the age distribution of candidates on the wait list was critical to the actual uh, protocol we developed. But I think I would actually go further and, and say that the, the, the data, the, the empirical outcomes may actually, once you run the protocol a little bit, make you think twice about your ethical framework, uh, right? It, you, you find some um, result uh, based on a simulation model, for example, of your norm of ethical framework. And it wasn't actually that the protocol you derived wasn't representing that framework. It's just that you didn't really realize what that framework would really mean. And uh, perhaps the weight on one principle or the other was too high or too low. Um, and so that's the more controversial point. I think everybody here would agree with this point, but whether or not these empirical outcomes should actually influence the normative ethical reasoning directly is a point I would like to, an assertion I'd like to make, and hopefully some of the examples can, will bring that home over the course of the talk. All right, so crisis standards of care. Uh, what is that? Um, this is a picture of Memorial Hospital on August 31st, 2005, uh, several days after Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, causing the levees to fail and massive flooding. Um, at this point, the hospital lost power. They just had a backup generator and they could take care of, I think roughly it was like a third of their uh, ventilated patients could continue to receive mechanical ventilation. So they literally had to decide who, who was going to live and who was going to die. Um, and this, this uh, tragedy, as well as the uh, influenza pandemic, H1N1 H1 influenza pandemic, led the Institute of Medicine to develop the concept of crisis standards of care. Um, and you know, just to put make this more specific, to go back to our example of these three patients, it's this horrible, tragic choice of literally having to decide which one will receive care, and the other two will will not receive the will life support and you know die instantly, which uh, unfortunately happened in that uh, situation, and uh, was always a threat to happen in the U.S. during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, so. What's this, what's this concept? How do you formalize this situation? Um, the Institute of Medicine called it a crisis standards of care, which is when a disaster, either an acute one like Hurricane Katrina or a pervasive one like a, a viral pandemic causing respiratory failure, um, leads to a substantial change in the ability to, of, of healthcare operations. Basically a disaster causes absolute scarcity, necessitating rationing. Right, you're you're past the point where, with different contingency measures, you could really theoretically take care of anyone. We're not talking about these relative scarcity issues anymore. We're in the zone of absolute scarcity of life support therapies. Um, so, what practical protocols have been proposed uh, throughout the United States? Uh, so, Gina Pisticello, formal McLean Ethics Fellow wrote a really nice article with Mark and, um, uh, and other co-authors from the university uh, of a systematic review of all the ven ventilator protocols. This was back in the summer of 2020. Uh, at the time, only 26 states even had a plan about what to do, despite you know, the pandemic still being still raging um, and this always being a threat and getting very close to crisis standards of care in various states uh, throughout the entire pandemic. Um, and the documents vary widely. Uh, here's, here's an example. I think the first time Gina made this uh, map, basically every state was a different color so, because they're so unique in their own way. Everyone put their little wrinkle on their protocol. Um, again, without necessarily reference to a specific ethical framework that they were derived from, right? Just uh, various uh, manipulations to the actual algorithm that patients would be sorted by. 
But predominantly, uh, one, one thing that carries through this is this idea of saving the most lives by rank ordering patients according to the sequential organ failure assessment score or SOFA. You might've seen that in a couple extra of my slides earlier. So I only an explanation of what that is. It's a bedside and laboratory um, scoring system where you incorporate the patients. It's, you know, it's kind of intuitive. Each, each organ system, you get a, a certain number of points from zero to four, you add them all up. The more points you have, the sicker you are and the higher probability of death. Um, it's pretty well validated in non in um, non COVID patients. Its performance in COVID patients is somewhat worse, uh, but you know reasonably well calibrated. Where because of its intuitive nature, you know as you pick up more end organ failures, the probability of survival to hospital discharge uh, declines um, re relatively linearly in the middle of the scale. Um, and so most of these state protocols were built around this score and this concept. Here's the New York uh, protocol that was, Cuomo decided under no circumstances would he activate, which is another interesting political dimension to this. But um, I think we'll stay focused on the ethics here. Uh, the, you know, people get color codes according to their uh, level of SOFA score. Uh, red is the top priority group with the SOFA score of less than seven. And they would go first, followed by yellow and then blue. And then green are people who don't, who don't need ventilation, ventilation. But this is, again, sort of derived from military triage is where these, where these color codes come from. And um, there's no, if this is kind of a pure save the most live system, very little consideration of other principles. Um, there are some exclusion criteria, but not many. And um, the tiebreaker is a random lottery. So it's sort of save the most lives, then uh, you know treat people equally, uh, lexically uh, ordered, right? Pennsylvania and the model policy put forth by Doug White early in the pandemic and Scott Halpern uh, is a multi-principle framework, which includes saving the most lives and saving the most life years. Now, interestingly, they don't conceptualize save the most life years by using the patient's age, despite that being probably the most important factor for determining how many life years someone has left is how old they are. Uh, but rather they use their uh, chronic conditions, whether they had major chronic conditions, which means death was likely within five years or severe chronic conditions. So meaning death was likely within one year. So it's it saved the most life years in this very constrained sense, right? Over this like five year time frame, um, And then save the most lives was operationalized by various sofa tiers and you in adding these points together from these two different rows essentially you can sort of back out the relative weight of both of their print of the, both of these principles in the ethical framework um, but it doesn't really seem like there was the classic normative ethical reasoning here's my ethical framework and now i'm going to pull out this protocol from that right it sort of seemed like let's put this out there as an idea um, and you know i think when Doug was here giving his talk, fully admitted that this, the actual weights and scores of each of these categories, certainly not set in stone. Um, but I think he would, they were trying to lay down a marker and explain, you know, operationalize how you would actually construct an algorithm that would incorporate multiple eth uh, rel ethically relevant principles. And for that, which they should be tremendously lauded. Um, so this, they actually wrote after the H1N1 pandemic and then re-upped re for um, re-upped for the COVID pandemic. Um, so one problematic issue immediately with this uh, policy and why it got a lot of heat from uh, various groups is that they had some examples of what would be a major and severely life-winning um, condition to help guide people and actually put, assigning the points for both of those uh, disease processes. And you see like one example is of a major comorbidity is end-stage renal disease in patients less than 75. Well, operationally, that would lead to some very problematic examples. Here's one where a 40-year-old patient on dialysis who has SOFA score is six, so pretty likely to survive to hospital discharge from their COVID-19 respiratory failure, ends up with a higher score, so lower priority, than an 80-year-old patient with a much lower probability of survival to discharge, who gets three points, right? Um, so this is a situation where the protocol has actually putting much more weight on, um, I mean, I hear it, it's sort of a protocol failure, I would say, 
to operationalize either of the principles that um, that they that they hold dear, right? But it also shows that there are in, embedded in in the way that they're you're writing this down and turning it into a mathematical uh, uh, system, you're constructing a relative weight between these two principles, um, sort of after the fact and instead of beforehand, right? Um, and so uh, we, you know, Dwight Miller led a a uh, pulmonary critical care fellow and Monica Peake and I wrote an article about how that these uh, these types of scarce uh, resource allocation scores, particularly with the, the major chronic conditions, which are so much harder to define what, you know, what is death likely within five years, how can we accurately predict that could exacerbate health disparities because of structural inequity and the uh, burden of, of disease, of chronic diseases in disadvantaged communities. And so, you know, uh, lots of uproar across the country about these points. Massachusetts's plan was very similar to the Penn plan originally. And then because of, you know, disability groups, um, other groups, you know, advocating for racial equity, got rid of the major chronic condition points. And in, in fact, they sort of fallen out of favor altogether. Um, I think later on, I'll, I'll show you Doug White's new framework, which um, again, removes these major chronic condition points. Um, and, and the idea here is that it creates a violation of treating people equally or, um, you know, giving priority to the worse off who have, because of structural disadvantage from racial inequity that pre-existed COVID um, in a very problematic way that wasn't acknowledged in the initial framework. Maryland has a slightly different system, right? Again, dropping the chronic conditions. And, uh, but I just show you this example too, to, about all of the details and complexity that are embedded in this. As you notice, all the SOFA points are different, right, than uh, both in the New York and Pennsylvania system. And why, why does this one have SOFA 9 to 11 for two points compared to Pennsylvania, which has SOFA 6 to 9 for two points? What ethical, what's the ethical foundation for that decision? None's really specified. And so the arbitrariness of this is, I think really problematic as well, um, despite these people doing doing their best, obviously. And the tiebreakers, which is how if somebody has the same primary score, vary way more than the scores the scoring systems themselves. Uh, again, this is another map that had like almost a different color for every state, right? Um, and the green here is not mentioned. No, no clear way to, to break the ties. So hopefully at least they would have defaulted to a lottery, but they didn't write anything down. Um, but, you know, ideas for lotteries that were popular were age, using it as a secondary consideration only, you know, as a lottery or um, first come first serve or first responders or healthcare workers. Um, so what's what to take away from all these protocols that came out? I mean, basically every components of all the protocols varied, different SOFA cutoffs, different number of possible scores. Um, and, you know, I feel like these would have very ethically important important differences and underscore this idea that a lack of formal empirical thinking about these issues can lead to a lot of variation in arbitrary decision making that doesn't necessarily have a sol solid foundation in ethical reasoning. Um, and, you know, I think one really important tool to help illuminate the ethical consequences of these practical choices is simulation modeling. And so what I'm going to do now is show you some of the work we've been we've been up to um, and over the past year, literally been working on this for a year to actually use real data from COVID-19 patients to simulate the allocation of scarce resources and some of the, um, the established state protocols that exist. And you know, ultimately this is the framework that I think should be used to actually develop a protocol de novo um, and help refine, start with an ethical framework, come with a protocol, simulate it, refine both the protocol and perhaps your ethical framework if the unintended consequences were quite severe. And I'll show you some data from our results. So what did we do? Well, we got data from all of the U of C and Northwestern system. 20, we're up to 2,400 patients now um, through both surges of the pandemic. These are critically ill people with COVID-19 who were admitted to the ICU. Um, so not all were on mechanical ventilators, some high flow of cannula in this setting, but we're in hypoxic respiratory failure, pretty much going to die without life support of some kind, not necessarily delivered in a critical care setting, but um, need, need life support to survive. And here's an example, ran, two randomly selected 
people, right? And so what the algorithm does is you score for each of these two people and you allocate the resource, we out, the algorithm allocates in the simulation model, the resource to the person with the lower score or however the algorithm says to do it, right? So in this example, I think this is the Pennsylvania scores, so this 28 year old sort of wins the pairwise comparison with the 80 year old. Um, and they would be allocated the resource. And the way you calculate the total number of lives saved of the system overall is you observe the actual survival outcome of the recipient because thankfully we know what happened to all 2,400 people in our data set, right? Because we didn't hit crisis standards of care in Chicago. So we gave everybody critical care and we can observe their actual outcomes. And then we assume that the person in the simulation who didn't get critical care died. Um, and so you repeat this process for the entire sample and you can see, you know, you, you, here's a 50% allocation shortage rule. You know, so half of the patients are assigned to palliative care, um, on no, no critical care resources assumed to die. And then of the patients who are, of the patients who are assigned to critical care or allocated the resource, you observe their survival. Um, and so obviously, or, and here's the data that we had. Um, I think if you look at this table closely, you can figure out which hospital was U of C in which is Northwestern, if you look at the insurance uh, status and, uh, and um, the racial uh, demographics. But just to show you, the reason I'm showing you all these numbers is to show you that we had a very diverse data set, which I think was a pretty good sample, representative sample of COVID-19 patients sort of across Chicagoland, across various socioeconomic groups. Um, and they were sick though, they all had, uh, these are median SOFA scores within the first 24 hours of presentation. Uh, sickest at tertiary hospital A, all requiring life support of some kind with high mortality rates. Um, the lowest was, you know, ranging from 16 to 25 percent by center. So um, consistent with people who likely would have died without critical care resources. Um, and what what protocols did we simulate? Here's the six. Um, you know, what were the 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 first is sickest first, which nobody that's a protocol that anybody would actually recommend. It's just there to show you that it's sort of the default um, rule of rescue was somehow operationalized in a pandemic and a crisis standard of care where you're only treating the patients with the highest SOFA scores, um, how inefficient that would be. A lottery is random allocation, youngest first, you know, is again, pretty simple. And then three of the state inspired protocols. The New York one, which is sort of so lowest SOFA first, right? Uh, based on SOFA tiers with random assignment within tiers. So it's kind of, it's it's both save lives and equal opportunity within that SOFA tier, right? And then two different multi-principal frameworks. So the Maryland one and the Penn one, which have different weights uh, on saving lives and saving life years. And then secondary considerations uh, like age, which they call life cycle, but you know, I think it's close to equivalent to fair innings, right? All right, so when we apply these scores to our data set, one thing that kind of jumped out right away to us is how many people got a score of one. It's like, you know, it's like vaccine allocation. Everybody was phase one, 1A, one 1B, one 1C, one right? The same thing here, uh, pretty much the predominant score, particularly in Maryland, um, most of the patients, even though they had organ failure, had not progressed up to the point where their SOFA scores were nine or 10, the things, the type of points that you would require multiple uh, you get multiple points in the system, right? So the majority of patients end up um, getting the same score or the plurality in Pennsylvania of one, meaning that the tiebreakers are gonna dominate this process, right? Um, and you wouldn't know this unless you implied, you apply these, this protocol to data, right? And so that's why that step is so critical. Um, and so how efficient are these systems? Well, they range from the sickest first, if you take the, the sickest patients, you only treat them and you don't treat the healthy patients, well, obviously the survival of that cohort is, is the lowest. Um, so again, that's just there not as a serious system anyone's proposing, but as a, as a counterexample. And then lottery improves survival significantly up to 80%, which that's about the average survival in the data set, which makes sense. Youngest first, lowest SOFA score first, and the multi-principal frameworks all improve survival above and beyond what a lottery can because they're selecting for people who are more likely to survive the hospital discharge. So again, the ethical principle of maximizing benefits, that's how much bang for your buck you're getting there between eight and 11% improvement in survival with each uh, ICU resource allocated. 
Um, and as the shortage, degree of shortage increases, um, the multi-principle frameworks in particular perform even better. So if you're only allocating ventilators to one out of four people, for example, and you're using a system to identify that one out the healthiest 25%, then the efficiency of that system improves relative to lower degrees of shortage where you're treating almost most of the patients, the uh, efficiency gain in terms of lives saved uh, for multi-principle frameworks, for pr principles or frameworks based on SOFA score is lower. Um, so that's what that's supposed to show you here. And the, the comorbidity penalties, this is kind of by construction based on the way we define them because we use the Alex Hauser score for which is a, a measure of chronic disease and sort of define it by percentiles. But in both the Maryland and Pennsylvania system, if you had a chronic condition, you got those extra points for having a chronic condition, nobody in our simulation received critical care. So the designers of the system didn't mean for chronic conditions uh, for the life year saved principle to override uh, saving the most lives, but that's what happened there, right? Um, that's what happens empirically when you apply the score to actual data, the actual distribution of the data. And so that's why the, the point values here are critically important. And the design of the algorithm is so important to actually execute the ethical framework that you you you, uh, you sought out to to fulfill. And then, as I alluded to earlier, because everybody's got a score of one, the tiebreakers are huge, right? And what are the tiebreakers? Well, they're age based in both uh, the Maryland and Pennsylvania system. And I should say the Pennsylvania system has a tiebreaker, a minus one priority for healthcare workers and frontline essential workers, which we do, weren't able to simulate because of data limitations. So whether or not you, you can't really call these any of these protocols the actual state policy i think it's better to refer them to, to them in general but the idea here is if there's an age tiebreaker and everybody ends up in the first category that age tiebreaker is actually going to be the dominant principle ethically and this system in practice would be a, set, a youngest first uh, operation for the for 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 what what actually usually occurs amongst the patients um, and so further refinement of the point system and different SOFA cutoffs may, may tilt things back towards saving the most lives, right? But without simulation and applying this to data, you can't know that. Um, and then, you know, disturbingly, but not unexpectedly, uh, black patients, particularly the ones who, you know, arriving to UFC, uh, had higher SOFA scores at presentation because of delayed access to care and uh, structural racism causing chronic diseases. And so when you, especially if you look at the cohort who are mechanically ventilated, black patients would systematically be allocated uh, less critical care. And then if you looked at just the survival by racial and ethnic group across the whole cohort, this is exacerbated even further. Um, so this is the way that these scarce uh, healthcare resource allocation systems could exacerbate healthcare disparities by adding just sort of one more uh, structural inequity at the end of a, the long line of, um, you know, disparities all the way to the critical care stage. And, you know, why was there this disparity? I think I just said this earlier. SOFA scores amongst non-Hispanic Black patients were significantly higher, as well as the prevalence of major and severe chronic conditions. So nothing, unfortunately, nothing unexpected there. And um, so what are the conclusions of this modeling exercise? Treating the sickest first would save the fewest lives during crisis standards of care. I think that's pretty obvious. We didn't really, that's, you know, nothing too insightful there. But by prioritizing younger and healthier patients, multi-principled allocation protocols could save more lives than a lot or in more life years with the age tiebreakers. But this benefit comes at the detriment of black patients, patients with pre-existing uh, medical conditions, older patients. So this truly is sort of an equity efficiency trade-off to use that terminology. Um, and that policymakers need to, 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 to strike a difficult balance and an explicit balance. Um, and I think these types of tools are critical for defining that point between efficient, uh, efficiency and, and equity. And I would argue it's actually impossible to get there without, without this type of simulation modeling. All right, uh, so, and here's an example. So Doug White and Bernie Lowe have proposed a revised algorithm, dropping the major uh, chronic condition points that were so problematic and including negative points uh, for people who live in areas with high area deprivation index. This idea of using geography to counteract the, the forces of structural racism, structural inequity in the US. 
And that is awesome, awesome idea. But how many points did you subtract from the score, right? That doesn't fall out of ethical theory. That's got to be derived from data. Um, so I think this, this is, again, what, what I think Doug, Doug has done such a great job at and Bernie has done such a great job at is laying down a marker for this, for this field and putting, a, putting something on paper, um, recognizing that there need, a lot more work needs to be done to get all the points right and all the mechanics of this system. And th that process may also reveal that the underlying ethical framework has one or two issues that we need to deal with. All right, so what I actually think, one last point about ICU before I do a couple of examples of vaccine to wrap up here, um, is that withdrawal of critical care resources would be the critical process. So, you know, when the pandemic hits, you fill up your ICU and you take care of as many people as you can, right? You don't start rationing before you run out because you don't know. I mean, it's, it's a random process. So the ICU would become completely full and new people would be showing up in the ER. And the, I, the, the question would be whether or not to withdraw. And um, so here's an, here's an example. ICU's full, your sickest patient, currently in the intensive care unit, 54 year old guy, he's been on the vent for eight days. His SOFA score has gone up from six to 11 because now he has presser requirement and he's, he's on dialysis, let's say. But you know we're optimistic yeah, ICU doctors. We think we can get him through this. COVID takes a really long time to get better sometimes months, um, and, but in the ER, there's a new patient uh, who's 75 years old and his SOFA score is only five. There's literally no room in the end, no space left. Critical care is absolutely scarce. Who, uh, what do you do? Do you withdraw critical care support from patient B to give it to patient A? Well, depending on the protocol, you get dramatically different answers. So I guess a lottery system would just randomly assign or withdraw care uh, from not just patient B, but anybody in the, in the ICU, right? Uh, uh, that seems like that would have many serious flaws from an ethical, ethical perspective. Youngest first would always prioritize the youngest patient. New York has this very strict SOFA evolution-based system. When you apply it to this case, means that you would allocate to the new patient who's arrived in the ER. And Maryland constructs a very high barrier to withdraw like the family can appeal. I think in practice, there would be very few withdrawals under the Maryland system, although there is a mechanism for withdrawal for people who are getting incredibly ill. Um, and so in that case, patient B remains on the vent. So in, in order to actually simulate these extubation rules <clears throat> and figure out what would be happen um, in, in sort of a real time situation, uh, we built a dynamic micro simulation model uh, developed and coded by Berhan Sandiki from the, the Booth School, um, where and you know what happens here is patients are added dynamically to the wait list. They have a that you apply the allocation rule and the extubation rule at every time step. Um, this this model is amazing. It fits great uh, retrospectively on non-COVID data, and now we finally have enough COVID data to make it work in real time. So what I what we hope to get at this is really how many lot more lives could you save? by executing some of these extubation rules, um, as well as deal with some of the other limitations of our simple Monte Carlo model I showed you earlier. All right, so I'm gonna spend about, you know, five, five, 10 more minutes uh, max on talking about protocol failures in vaccine allocation. Um, you know, there's a lot to critique about US vaccine allocation uh, from a logistical failure uh, perspective. But what I'm, what I'm gonna try to focus on are problems in taking these ethical principles, which are the ones that the CDC the Advisory Committee, uh, Committee on Immunization Practices hung their hat on. They're mostly derived from the uh, National Academy of Medicine framework, which was inspired by an article written by Govin Prasad, Monica Peak, and Zeke Manuel. Um, three principles here, maximize benefits, promote justice, which is this idea that we want to protect and advance equal opportunity for maximum health. So that might that lets you treat people differently, right, based on their health needs. And then the idea of mitigating health inequities is an explicit goal, is an ethical good in and of itself, as listed on this principle framework. So some good, solid principles, not going to spend time debating if these were the right ones, or maybe there should have been more structure here, like they should have been ordered, rank ordered in some way. Um, but I'm going to hopefully convince you that through a series of decisions, the actual protocols that were developed and the decisions that were made 
violate these principles in various ways. Um, <clears throat> and so here's the, the phases that the advisory community immunization practices came out with that um, you know, disseminated across the states. Every state did it a little bit differently, but were incredibly influential. Um, and a, a lot, I have a lot of problems with these phases in various ways, but I think focusing specifically on problems where the product deriving the protocol from the um, from the framework was flawed. I'm going to talk about age based uh, allocation and the lack of geogra geographic prioritization. So age based allocation was this concept of COVID risk we know increases exponentially with age, right? So let's just use simple age cutoffs and ignore all of their relevant factors. Well, the problem with that is that the first cutoff they proposed was 75 years. The immediate life expectancy for an African-American in the United States is 74 years. So they create enormous disparities in access just by construction, by using age as the only factor that you're gonna allocate vaccines on. Not to mention that it's not the most efficient system, right? The most efficient system would be a multi, uh, a score that leads on, on many different factors to identify those at highest risk for death from COVID-19. Yeah, age may be the most important input into that prediction model, but there's everyone else knows that diabetes, other chronic conditions, uh, and place-based risk, which we'll get to in a second, are huge factors as well for determining risk. So this kind of simplistic, let's just use age, throw our hands up in the air, uh, approach is very problematic and you know let made states kind of scramble um, to to fix what they were given from the federal government and you know I think Illinois did the right call Dr. ZK from the public health department by lowering the age of eligibility to 65 year olds uh, for phase 1b explicitly for these equity equity considerations and I would argue probably for maximizing benefits um, you don't know the latter until you and actually see the data um, simulated based on different different types of approaches. And so uh, Govin uh, had a nice Washington Post article where he formalized this to the argument, you know, in, in Maine, they got even crazier with the ages and they went like, you know, in 10 year intervals all the way down uh, to 18 year olds. And so their system would prioritize the healthy work from home 50 year old over a 45 year old, 44 year old who's working in the community, a high risk community, exposed to COVID all the time with diabetes. You know, that that sort of policy is not only inequitable, it's also inefficient. It violates the um, core print ethical principles that um, the CDC has laid out and represents a protocol failure, right? Um, and as I mentioned before, place-based risk is an enormous risk factor for COVID. If you look at the burden of COVID mortality across the city of Chicago on the left, um, the, there are some areas that literally have 10 times the rate of COVID uh, mortality compared to others. You know, that's, if you, you think about it on, uh, on age, yeah, age is a huge risk factor, but that's, you know, bigger than the difference between a 75 and a 65 year old. It, it's on the same order of magnitude. So a more educated or more enlightened empirically based system of vaccine allocation would have explicitly incorporated geography uh, into, the, into the allocation mechanism. But as you can see, unfortunately, in the city of Chicago, we actually did the opposite. We gave much more vaccine to the, the least hit areas of the city, uh, neglecting you know, the basic needs of you know, thousands in, in, in the, in, across the city and probably saving fewer lives. And uh, one of my uh, summer med students here in Zhang is gonna be working on quantifying just how many were lost because of this inequity. Um, and why? Well, it's structural, of course. Um, you know, it's not necessarily, I mean, there were some conscious policy choices perhaps, but it's also like, well, let's just, we got to send some vaccine to each of the pharmacies, right? Well, where are the pharmacies? They're on the north side, they're in the well-off neighborhoods. And so if you just kind of let the status quo roll and you're not thoughtful about your allocation protocol, um, you're going to violate your ethical principles. Uh, and that's what happened in the city and across the US. It wasn't just a Chicago problem. These are deep-seated structural inequities that without any conscious focus on equity uh, get exacerbated. And, you know, relating to that, we didn't pour the water where the fire was burning, right? You know, you're, there were hot spots in Michigan and Texas and other areas. And there was just this sticking with per person uh, vaccine allocation at all costs, right? And I think mainly by political reasons, but there's just no, there was not any 
even people were trying to construct empirical arguments that it, would, it was too late to surge vaccines to Michigan. Well, if that's true, then where's the next Michigan, right? Why, why, why did Michigan happen? Why didn't we send more vaccines to Michigan a month ago? Um, and the lack of empiricism, I think, definitely costs lives. Um, and so I'll just end with um, a comment about dosing strategies. Uh, so I think this is a, represents a protocol failure, a failure of a protocol, in this case, uh, how to distribute the first and second dose of the mRNA vaccines that violates the core CDC ethical principles. You know, the first dose efficacy was obvious from the first RCTs that you can see that after tw 12 days of after the first dose, the clearly the first dose of the mRNA vaccine kicks in. And the three and four week intervals were totally arbitrarily designed. They were designed, they were that short because it was like the minimum a feasible interval that they could uh, get past immunologists and get the trials done really quickly. And so the UK saw this and they decided to postpone the second dose to 12 weeks. Reasonable move. The share of their vaccinated population was dramatically higher than the United States early on. And about two weeks after this point here, about two weeks after that those vaccination curves separate, go figure the case curves separate too. People will talk about the differences in lockdowns and non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, but you know that the timing is pretty eerie. And if you actually look at the number of deaths potentially averted, um, can, if the U.S. Had, had followed the U.K. strategy, it's a staggering number and working on more formal quantifications of this going forward. And of course, that exacerbated the same vaccine equities I was alluding to earlier. You know, if you're if you're sticking to short dosing intervals and you start out by giving all the first doses to the well off and well connected, then now you're given second doses, which have marginal benefit at best to those same people before you're providing access to the most disadvantaged in society. Um, and so that's an article we wrote up in the USA Today. You can sort of if you want to check that out, you can read this, read the argument more formally. And then um, the J and J pause is another uh, thing I'll just say one minute about uh, that I think was a, a, a deadly mistake. Here's an article uh, Gobin and I wrote up in the Washington Post. You know, the the commute the ASIP committee is composed of all these vaccine experts, which of course you need vaccine experts, but there was nobody on there to do risk benefit analysis. There were no ethicists, there are no health services researchers who really were weighing the downsides of this policy decision. And, you know, this may have happened anyway without the pause, but I, you know, I would have felt a lot better if this had not occurred, right? If I was, if I was on ASAP, that the, the day after the, the, the pause is enacted, first dose vaccination rates plummet. Um, and when they finally did do the risk benefit analysis, it was obviously strongly in favor of continuing J and J vaccines on an individual level and giving patients the option for a one dose shot because the risk, assuming the risk of COVID in their community was, you know, reasonably high. All right, and so, you know, I just still wonder with all this vaccine stuff, how much of this area under the curve of these cases could have been averted with better protocols that better adhered to the ethical principles that the CDC laid out. Um, so I think I said all this already and failed to properly hire its own ethical framework. And in contrast to critical care allocation, there weren't many equity efficiency trade-offs. These were all protocol failures that sort of violated all the principles that they laid out. And I really do think that you got to do the math um, if you're in this allocation of scarce medical, absolutely scarce medical resources game, you can't shy away from complexity. You have to engage these issues uh, empirically and quantitatively. And I want to thank all my co-authors, starting with Gina, who's you know really the expert that I always talk to about all the details, all the protocols, um, and and Govin and Zeke and uh, Monica for all our work on vaccine stuff. And of course, my perennial mentors, Dr. Seeler and Dr. Ross at the McLean Center, for all your work uh, mentoring me over the years, and also for the Vaccine Allocation Committee for your thoughts. All right, one minute, one minute under the hour. So great. Thank you, thank you very much, Will. That you, uh, that was a whirlwind. Um, got a couple of questions. I want to start with Pat Narikis, who says, "Would you consider lack of beds physically in an ICU or pushing nursing ratios beyond beyond the safe level to constitute an absolute scarcity, or more of a relative one?" Feels like we are always stretching thinner, boarding in the emergency department. 
but at least at UCMC have never had the number of physical ventilators to be the issue. Yeah, I think those are examples, good examples of relative scarcity. You know, why is the nursing staff ratio low? Well, it's just we're not paying nurses enough, you know, to get them in, right? Or why, why do we have too many ICU patients per house staff or per attending? It's because we're just not, people are at home, not working. It's not like every critical care attending is working in the, in the ICU all the time. Uh, so I think all of those things are self-imposed. I mean, this came up at one point, our MICU census was in the high 40s. That's a lot of patients. But we got like 90 ICU beds by the state. You know, we still had a lot of capacity. I pointed that out. I was like, that's all federally available. So the, I've, I feel like those all were in the category of re relative scarcity. I do want to say, though, like my black and white, it's absolute or relative scarcity dichotomy is obviously not true. It's there are there are gray areas there. Great, thanks. Um, we had an anonymous attendee who, who wrote, is scarcity in many parts of the developed world a national security and intelligence failure, especially during the early months of the COVID? Yeah, like how, why did, why did we end up in situations of absolute scarcity? Yeah, that's sort of above my expertise and, you know, uh, exactly how these things occur, why there isn't enough oxygen in India, for example, um, and how that can be rectified. And of course, you know, I think for every hour you spend thinking about what to do when you're in absolute scarcity, you should spend 100 hours trying to prevent absolute scarcity from occurring in the first place. Great. Uh, Dr. Bob Shung writes, super interesting talk. Thank you. Is it possible that you try to tune your model to find the parameters, sofa cutoffs, what size bonuses to give certain subgroups, et cetera, that would maximize lives saved or whatever outcome you're looking at? That's, that's the idea of, um, you know, that's uh, why we want to build a simulation model. And then also, I think, provide kind of rigorous justification, the nuts and bolts of ideas like, let's save the most lives we can subject to the constraint of equitable allocation across race and gender, for example. And so, you know, to prove your protocol is actually meeting those, that ethical framework, um, you need a simulation model. But you also, you know, I think sometimes doing this empirical work makes you really think about the ethical framework that you're, you know, trying to implement and whether that makes sense and you've done the proper ethical analysis. Uh, Rawls called that to be in reflective equilibrium, to go back to your models and modify them to go along with your empirical data. Uh, Kevin Dirksen said, this is a great presentation. Thank you. How has your modeling work accounted for the use or absence of ECMO? Is there any data on COVID-19 health inequities with ECMO allocation, modeled or actual? As a critical care physician and health services researcher, I'm interested in your thoughts about how ethicists, public health experts, and policymakers can better account for the complexities of ECMO deployment and its particular particularities, limited staff and stuff as the pandemic continues and may represent something of a chronically scarce resource in some communities at baseline. Yeah, Kevin, it's an awesome question. I feel like I've probably missed many opportunities to use ECMO as an example of an absolutely, that was the only resource in the United States was like demonstrably absolutely scarce. It's sort of for political, medical political reasons, sort of dominated by these teams and these arbitrary uh, notions of candidacy for ECMO uh, that are actually kind of value judgments based on the person's perceived quality of life and the, you know, sort of a clinical medical ethics issue about whether to initiate someone on ECMO, right? You know, if, if a 90 year old with a, uh, severe end stage dementia is in COVID ARDS about to have a hypoxic respiratory arrest, Putting that patient on ECMO would physiologically keep them alive, but often the ECMO team won't do that because they're making value judgments based on their quality of life. And that's status quo, even without the pandemic. And then, so what I think sort of happened is then we added this added layer of actual absolute scarcity of ECMO on top of that, and things got really messy. But um, yeah, it's, it's an area we should be studying more, uh, Gina, has uh, Pistello's designed an amazing survey that like seven uh, institutions have filled out about their ECMO practices, and especially about informed consent for ECMO. Uh, but I think it's some something that hopefully, you know, the data, there were more, there's bigger numbers um, for my, my type of skill set uh, would be really rich area. I don't know if that answered the question, but. Oh, so no, you know, I think you answered the question very well. You know, it did make me think though, as you were talking, I. I I think on part four of your six part talk, you talked about extubation rules. Yeah. And I just wanna push you on that because 
Well, extubation might be a way to say, take care of everyone at first. And then when you start hitting scarcity, switch to crisis standards of care. The difficulty of looking at a patient who might get better and removing them from the ventilator, how feasible do you really think that is? I, I don't think it's super feasible. I think, um, and there'd be a tremendous cost to that, both emotionally and then literally in terms of physical, like time and capacity, right? You got to take the ventilator off, clean the room, right? You know, there's logistical issues that make withdrawing different from withholding in this case, in, in a really practical, real way. Uh, so I think that's why the dynamic model is so important. If we're going to withdraw care in anybody, we better be experiencing like huge improvements in expected survival uh, in the model to justify it, right? There has to be, you know, the, the principle of saving the most lives, um, the way the, the, the improvement in that outcome has to be so large to justify because of the other concerns. Even if the improvements were really, really large, do you think doctors and nurses are going to be comfortable doing that? Yeah, I mean, take somebody <laughs> off a machine where they will benefit, but it might take them 10 days where somebody else might be able to get on and off in four days, he can save two instead of one. I, yeah, I, I mean, I think whether how this would actually happen, any of this stuff would happen in practice. Um, you know, I, I mean, the only thing we can sort of see in the Western world where it's gone down is age cutoffs for the ICU in Italy, where they just it's effectively kind of a youngest first uh, approach and, uh, without much withdrawal of care. So right, yeah, so withholding it, rather than a withdrawing, all withholding, all right, I, yeah. I, I'm not allowed to, uh, monopolize the time. So I'm going to go to the next comment <laughs> by Robert Sebesta. How would simulation model analysis handle midstream modifications to a framework and perfectly based measures for the sake of fairness, adapting GCS and SOFA for medically sedated patients halfway through the pandemic. And then he said, great work. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, the equity, like the equity corrections is a great example of this. So you want to correct for the fact that black patients in your community are going to have higher sofa scores of presentation and therefore receive less access to care. And you're willing to save fewer lives to ensure equitable allocation across race, which, you know, I think there's a great ethical argument for that. Um, the exact weight of the equity correction is going to depend on the distribution of SOFA scores in the African-American white population in your data set. Like, so it's gonna have to be dynamic. It's gonna, it might be one point in Chicago and three points in LA, I don't know, right? So um, what you're, you're totally correct. I mean, this, it, these systems have to be very smart if they're gonna work. And that's, I think, what, one, 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 what I'm pessimistic about this whole field is like, how realistic is, is that? actually, you know, politically, I mean, I think the math exists and the ethics exists, but from a practical standpoint, you worry about it ever getting there. Um, awesome Padela writes, wonderful work. I want to ask about the upstream ethical failures, meaning why do we focus on high tech solutions, ICU vaccines, and then have ethical failures as opposed to public health measures, which may be more efficacious? Is there a meta ethical principle we have missed, which prioritizes low tech? Is that like a meta criticism of my entire talk, which focused just on ICUs and vaccines. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I think, uh, right, I, like, so the- op when, you, yeah. when you talk, <laughs> good. Yeah, um, so allocation, right. I mean, the allocation of absolutely scarce healthcare resources, ideally in a pandemic doesn't have to happen at all because you do all the low tech stuff, um, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, to prevent the ICU from being overwhelmed. And then, you know, then vaccine allocation becomes less salient because the pandemic is not raging in your area, right? Uh, so it's not quite as important, but I think absolutely scarce healthcare resources, you know, that that problem is not going away. It's, I mean, deceased donor organ allocation, fortunately, I think it's gonna keep me employed, hopefully. Um, and, but yeah, I think you're right. Like. I, I would totally say for every hour talk you sit through like this, go to, you know, 100, 100, 100 times more effort should be uh, placed towards preventing absolute scarcity. So uh, Eugene Bereza, a former McLean fellow, writes, the default normative assumption in these protocols is often saving the most lives. Did you consider how to consider communities that explicitly reject this principle for religious or cultural reasons? 
Um, that's that's a great that's a great question. And you know, I think I sort of my talk I jump past the normative ethical debate. You know about what principles the right one. This is uh, for whatever reason socially that's a dominant uh, principle in both you know the vaccine allocation frameworks and the ICU allocation frameworks in the U.S. and and um, but yeah, and so I think that that uh, the actual protocol you need to derive is is built upon the foundation of the principles that are uh, culturally and socially relevant in that community. Um, so yeah, I think it's like you know it's but the added flexibility of using empirical methodologies is that you can you can sort of simulate whatever protocol derived from whatever framework you want. So um, it's some, somewhat agnostic. My, my approach is hopefully somewhat agnostic to the actual uh, ethical values. Connie Shao asks, what are your thoughts on vaccine passports, namely how to do them and letting vaccinated people be completely unmasked as incentive to the unvaccinated, assuming low rates of breakthrough infection of the vaccinated, large uptake of vaccination with greater incentivization? A uh, yeah, little, little. Um, yeah, I think that's a little off topic from like the main thrust of my. Um, uh, that's why I saved uh, it last. My, my, yeah, no, but it's. I think it's a. It's an interesting question. I. I really worry about building a vaccine passport on an incredibly inequitable vaccine allocation. You know, like it's only been easy to get a, a vaccine in the city of Chicago for like a week and a half, two weeks, and now you're like, okay, if you haven't got it yet, you need a passport to you know participate in society. That that doesn't seem fair to me. Um, but as on the flip side, I think using paid time off, cash incentives. Um, you know, like if you can't go into a concert without getting a vaccine, that sort of stuff seems fine, um, you know, from an ethical perspective. <laughs> Another project that you really need to uh, model is the distance people travel to get vaccines. Um, I, I just have to say that for many people who, well, we talk about the inequities of the vaccines, there was also some hesitancy that led to some of the disparities and there was some over zealous and um, I think it would be really interesting to see the distance that people were willing to travel to get vaccines. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, hopefully we can get that. Uh, you know, you know where, it's funny, you, you know where the vaccines were allocated <clears throat> based on freedom of information uh, requests from reporters. The thing that actually gets reported on the website continuously is where the people actually live who got the vaccine. Um, so that map I showed you was the home addresses of the vaccine recipients, but they might have gone, who knows where they went to get it. Um, and, you know, that's why I was so worried about ZocDoc and other forms of online only registration for vaccination, because uh, the, the wealth and well-connected can, can use those to take vaccines that were intended for disadvantaged communities. Exactly. Uh, I... I think all the rest of the comments, there was only one other comment that uh, is interesting, again, slightly unrelated, just like the passports is, in the original military triage, is rank seniority considered? I asked that, I'm fascinated because we did include docs as the 1A group. Um, so in a sense, if it were equivalent to military, um, does rank and seniority considered? Do you have any idea? Because I, I, don't, I, I don't think so, I'm not like a super, and military history expert on on the triages, but no, I think it's pure of saving the most lives. But it does bring up the issue of instrumental value, uh, right? And so, an instrumental value based system like we use for vaccine allocation would prioritize the general and stuff, right? Because you know they can do greater good for the military, um, and you know that might be problematic according to other principles. Well, on behalf of all of the people who ask questions and on behalf of the whole audience, I just wanna say thank you. That was a real whirlwind. You covered lots of different issues about equity and allocation and uh, showed the real point of the importance of empirical data to help us as we make or try to make ethical policies. So thank you very much. Mark, do you have any last words you wanna say? I'll be very quick. Um... Uh, thank you so much, Will. Uh, the, I agree with what Lainey said. Uh, the talk was extraordinary, and, and your work on empirical data research, which, which we helped to um, stimulate in the early 1980s, uh, 
as a model for ethics um, was, was to be congratulated. Um, so I wanna thank you enormously. I do wanna tell um, the, the crowd that's remaining that next week, as I said at the beginning, will be the last talk in the series of 27 talks on COVID-19. And the speaker will be Brian Callender, and he'll be talking on the topic. Um, it's called the COVID-19 pandemic, past, present, and future. Um, so we're looking forward uh, to that final talk and we'll thank you so much. Uh, you'll be meeting with the fellows uh, in 10 or 15 minutes. That's great. Thank you so much for the invitation, Mark. As I said, it's it's great to, you know, be a part of the McLean Center, continue to be part of the McLean Center and take forth such an amazing tradition of a great institution. I love the idea that you've been here since your medical school days. Over 10 years. So it's wonderful, Chris. Great. Thanks, Thank you, Lainey. Thank you.